infinite complacency. People went to and fro of the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, binning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. So on this edition of Into the Fray, I welcome on podcaster and documentarian Daniel James. The documentary, which you can see right now, is on YouTube. Type in The Moment Imaging, that is the name of the channel, or the title of the doc, which is The Bermuda Triangle of Pennsylvania. And Daniel, today we're not only going to be talking about that area you mentioned a couple facts in there that I had forgotten about, which are very interesting to me personally. But you have your own Sasquatch encounters, which we will probably close the the episode with. I'm very excited about that. You did send me links to a vlog where you talk about these encounters, but I already told you I, I didn't want to listen. I wanted to hear it fresh as we were recording. So first of all, welcome on. Thank you for reaching out. You, I think you just saw one of my posts searching for Bigfoot Encounters, and you're like, hey, I have some if you want to talk to me, so I appreciate you doing this. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It it really means a lot to be able to share these stories and express myself on these encounters, and so I'm just really grateful to be here. Now, are you you living in PA? Is that why you were interested in what you guys dubbed the Bermuda Triangle of Pennsylvania? Yes, I live right outside Pittsburgh. And uh, the Bermuda Triangle of Pennsylvania is just an hour away from where we live. Yeah, and it's mentioned in the doc. And I watched the doc, by the way. I told you I didn't watch the the vlog that you sent Thank me you. about the Sasquatch Encounters, but I did watch that nice doc. I enjoyed it. You guys did a really good job on that. I noticed you must have been filming in fall, right? When the colors were turning, it was, right. it was looking really beautiful there. So you mentioned three points on a map which constitutes this quote unquote Bermuda Triangle of PA, right? Which is very fitting. I've been out there myself to film for on the trail UFOs, stayed on Chestnut Ridge. What are those three points on the map before we kind of dive into that a little bit? There's dairy. There's uh well, you know what I'm drawing a blank on it to be honest. I'd have to go I honestly have to go back and check. No, that's okay. There's, I know no, that's no problem. I always I- Reference dairy because it was inspired by uh, it sp- inspired Stephen King's setting for it. It's my favorite of the of the three. Yeah, there's Kecksburg, obviously mm-hmm. for the the Kecksburg UFO event, dairy, and then I, I apologize. The third one's slipping me at the moment. I should have written it down. Now that I'm saying that, sorry about that. I was looking at it and I just did not put that in my notes as I was watching it. So yeah, one of the the facts in there, and I had completely forgotten about this because I. Union I Town, love, sorry. What was that? It's Union Town. Union, Union Town, Town, I just remembered. That's it, yes. To Kecksburg and Derry. Kecksburg, Derry, and Union Town. That is it, yes. Okay, so yeah, because Stephen King, I love if I'm reading something at, at night, normally it's Stephen King. I, I have only on a couple of occasions had to put it down because they freaked me out. One was Salem's Lot and It. It is a great read. Sorry. And of course, it is centered in Derry, Maine, but as you point right. out in the doc, everyone thinks, and it, it has been said, I, I believe by Stephen, that he visited Derry, PA at one time, and that was the inspiration for Derry, Maine throughout. If you are familiar with Stephen King's novels, Derry comes into many, many of his books. It's not just a, an it thing. That's right, because it is a long-known paranormal hotspot in Pennsylvania. Yeah, and as far as Dairy PA goes specifically, is it just like Chestnut Ridge and more over near Uniontown to where it it covers the gamut, UFOs and cryptids, and you have Mothman in the dock and Bigfoot, of course, or is there or is each point have a little bit more than the other point as far as another 
anomaly goes? I would say that after our research, all three share a similar in uh, congruent, consistent stories of the type of cryptids that are seen there in terms of UFOs and Sasquatch. And even more than that, we get into like, there's a whole community of these little troll-like creatures, these short, like goblin type entities. And then there's also dogman sightings and all three of the, or excuse me, all of those particular entities are consistent in all three points. And have you guys thought about why that would it would be such a proliferation of activity in this area? Do you think it's it's the natural geology, something like that? Right. So I, I study and I teach metaphysics. So a lot of my concepts are, you know, deeper into like the philosophical realm, but also I feel like in a sense backed by some sort of metaphysical science. So whenever we talk about uh, paranormal sightings that are local to a specific area, you could look into the concept of ley lines, which are the underground energetic, you know, currents that tend to amplify sort of the esoterica paranormal phenomenon. But another theory that I have is we talk more about, you know, cryptozoology and all of these creatures and entities and extraterrestrials that are so much in a sense outside of the mainstream awareness. Uh, I, my particular perspective and theory on why they manifest in certain areas geologically, oftentimes you'll see them in smaller towns or areas that have like a densified forested area. And I talk a lot about the concept of densities. So we as human beings and our planet and our collective consciousness could be considered as the third density or the third dimension. But then again, there are also so many more that layer on top of those and all around us in different frequency bands, kind of like a radio. So then you would have your fourth density frequency, your fifth density frequency. And I believe that uh, the reason why a lot of these beings sort of are so elusive, hard to find, we have no tangible evidence of their existence, is because they actually shift in and out of these other frequency bands more specifically the fourth and fifth density that are just sort of like right next to us all around us in every direction, but they're just outside of our 3D senses that we can only perceive them when and if uh, we, we, you know, our frequency matches the frequency of these other beings. So when I talk about densified sort of forested areas, it's also said that in areas that have, whether it's even a desert, wide, vast deserted areas, forested rolling mountains, anywhere where there is a, a lack, a less dense presence of humans, smaller communities of humans, but more communities of densified forest. In that energy, there tends to be a lighter frequency band that gets, like, in a sense, your your consciousness can vibrate faster towards the fourth and the fifth density frequencies around deserts, forested areas, rolling mountains and it's maybe not so much a lack uh, a lack of human presence but rather the concentrated dense density of the trees and nature are what help raise the frequency to getting into those fourth and fifth density frequencies or or dimensions if people prefer that term where these beings exist and they can tend to slip in and out of our reality from their own into ours back and forth and people will encounter more of those experiences when they're in those areas that are already a sort of a natural frequency, whether they have ley lines or they're just more densified in nature. See, that makes quite a bit of sense to me. And that doesn't sound actually that strange at all because of my own personal shadow person experience where I saw them running in the woods when I was around 12 years old. I always say that it was kind of like I just kind of got a glimpse into another a dimension is the best way that I can guess as to what happened, right? And either you could call it right place, right time, or some people, depending on their experience, would say wrong place, wrong time, because a lot of these experiences aren't that great, and they would rather forget them. And to piggyback off of that, now I'm not sensitive at all. I mean, we are all in some way, shape, or form, and if we choose to exercise those muscles, I think we can all train ourselves to be even more sensitive, right? However, there are people walking the planet that are 100% more sensitive than I am. They can't even go to a, a, house, a friend's house and go, oh, well, I have a really bad feeling about this place. Come to find out somebody 
did something horrible upstairs, you know, and they, the owners didn't even know. Anyhow, when we're talking about people that are more sensitive or they have trained themselves to go into maybe meditative states, much like you guys were kind of doing that at the end of the dock, right? You were sitting yes, we in, do. yeah, you were sitting in, um, Keystone Park, it was. I actually made a note of that, <laughs> Smart Shannon. Uh, Keystone Park, and you guys were executing meditation. So when it comes to these dimensions and being able to see these other things that are that are there, how much of that comes into play for you guys? And as far as your metaphysical side goes in your teachings and your knowledge on that, were you prior to executing things like meditation not as able to experience these things? And do you think that then ties into what you've experienced, what we'll talk about here shortly, in New York State and then in in California? Yes, that's a great question, by the way. So I've I've been practicing both meditation and channeling for seven years. And I have had paranormal and esoteric encounters with cryptids before that's happened. But ever since I learned how to deliberately uh, go into deep meditations, even trances, and then get into the channeling state as well, that's amplified my the 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 sort of frequent occurrences and how intense the encounters are when they do happen. And I believe it's just because it's a matter of frequency and consciousness that when we as individuals, when we as beings, when we vibrate faster we can sort of connect to those other frequencies better. And this can both be passive or deliberate, but that's why uh, many times in our cryptozoology investigations, we're always working very uh, consciously with, with the way energy works and being of the right frequency and intention to have these types of contacts. So we will often will go into light meditative trances or even do channelings in the woods or, or in areas that have a lot of sightings to sort of, in a sense, amplify the contact. And this doesn't require any technology or investigative tools. It really is just understanding that like vibration attracts like vibration. So if you're, if you're coming with pure intent and, uh, you know, clean will that you put yourself in that meditative frequency to have contact, it, it creates much more of a conducive space where these things can happen and you can have an encounter. So the word intention, that comes up all the time when it comes to paranormal and it will bleed into the cryptid world, right? And people say, you got to go in the woods and you put it out there. I'm not here to harm you. But when you guys are out there or maybe when, even if, I don't know if you go out by yourself or with a, a group, if you do anything like that, but do you, what if you went out there with the intention of, you know, contacting Bigfoot, if that's, I don't know if contacting is the right word, but you're putting out the intention, oh, I want to have an experience with Bigfoot. But you also, I mean, again, I don't know if you do this, but what if someone, let's just do a hypothetical, they want to have an experience with Bigfoot, but they like to carry a sidearm because there's crazy people and cougars in the woods. Is that going to cancel itself out because it's a higher being and it, it's going to know that it, this person, oh, they want to, they want to high five me, but they're carrying a sidearm or would the intention cancel that out? And they're going to know this person's not going to hurt me. Another awesome question. So the answer is yes, it's going to change and sort of in a, in a sense, instigate the type of interaction you can have. So what I mean by that is let's say, for example, you bringing out your audio recorders, your night vision cameras, because you want evidence and you want to capture the elusive being for for to you know to share uh, you know to provide proof right that's point number one let's say alternatively you want to go out and you're carrying firearms you have weapons uh to protect yourself because there is wildlife and when people are doing cryptozoology investigations you can encounter dangerous animals that's another thing but also in the back of your mind when we think about the sasquatch uh the yeti the skunk ape the bigfoot we're also, because of the lack of evidence and the lack of understanding, humans are innately defensive um, and we tend to assume the worst. So even if we go out there with the best of intentions, a lot of people would feel more safe, some type of protection, because they just, it's the unknown. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if they're peaceful. We've heard, you know, uh, stories of them being hostile. But when you go out with your your technology, to provide evidence and you go out with your weapons to protect yourself it doesn't mean that you won't necessarily have an encounter but the type of encounter that you're sort of inviting through your your vibrational intent 
can actually create more of a negative experience. And that's just in my own personal sort of opinion. So when I go out for these types of investigations, I don't actually bring my audio recorders. I don't have my cell. I don't bring my cell phone and I don't bring any weapons because I do believe that sort of our reality is created from a, an energetic vibrational point, a singularity point first. And then what we put out is what we get back. So if I go out there with the expectation of, of being in some kind of danger or having my technology to capture the creatures so that I can provide proof and evidence, then it's, it's working almost in a sense like a reverse magnet. And I could be, be then sort of like, in my personal opinion, speaking for myself, create be, be creating a negative experience. I know as an investigator that if I go out there to have an experience, I just want the experience and having evidence to, to prove to people that I've been there and I've done it and that it exists is less important to me than just being there and, and knowing that it happened. I can definitely appreciate that. I've said it many, many times because you can, you can have what you think is a fantastic pic or video of insert the cryptid or whatever it might be, ghost, and you just get ripped apart. So I think I, I you know, I like that where you go out, you kind of just go out for you and having the experience. Yeah, that's right. So what about somebody, Daniel, that is admittedly, you know, they, they're, they've never meditated. They can't get into that headspace, but they do go out with that intent and they mean it with all their heart. Do you think that they have a better shot at this than somebody just kind of traipsing around the woods going, Hey, Bigfoot, come on out, buddy. I want to, I want to hang out with you. And maybe they're, they're more apprehensive about it at heart. I believe that everybody can have an encounter and you don't have to meditate. You don't have to channel. It's, it's a matter of, like we go back to the, the concept of intention if you just have the intention to have an experience and you're open to whatever may happen without a assigning any sort of particular expectation on the outcome or any specific experience, it can happen to anybody and they don't need these sort of metaphysical tools to do so. My first encounter, which I'd love to talk to you about here later, uh, was before what I call a spiritual awakening. You know, if, if anyone's familiar with that concept where you something happens in your life, maybe a traumatic event, there, you, there usually is like a catalyst or a trigger for a spiritual awakening where your perspective changes on, on the mechanics of reality. My first Sasquatch encounter happened before anything like that happened to me in terms of my understanding of, uh, you know, sort of like that sort of cosmic perspective. So anybody can have an encounter. I just, at the point that I'm at now, I've just learned to sort of be able to instigate it a little bit more concisely. It makes me want to just go into the desert and, and try the, the intent thing and, and say, hey, yucca man, come on out and say hi, buddy. It's, right. it's about time, right? And, and I love that you mentioned deserts real quick. I have to stress the importance of deserts. So a lot of times, you know, because of our, our films and our movies and our television, we think that the forest is where the, the UFO is going to appear or the Sasquatch is going to appear. But there's very, very conductive spiritual energy in deserts. And people can have uh, deep, deep spiritual connections and almost psychedelic experiences in deserts. I just wanted to put that out there. In fact, have you ever been out to Sedona, Arizona? I mean, somebody like you that can get into that headspace that, that easily, it sounds like you can pretty easily now. I wonder what kind of experiences you would have in Sedona. I plan to. I haven't been yet, but I have a really good personal friend who lives there and she's invited me to come visit whenever I'm willing and able and I have the time she wants to just take us out and she's had her own personal experiences in cryptozoology out there as well so I plan to but I have not yet that place is so stunning I mean I'm from the desert grew up in the desert and some parts of Utah reminded me a little bit of Sedona I've been in some parts that look a little bit like Mars the surface of Mars but there's nowhere like Sedona even myself my jaw was on the floor so <laughs> yeah incredible I look place. forward to it holy cow all right, so before we move on, and again, guys, we're, we're chatting a little bit about the doc, the Bermuda Triangle of Pennsylvania. Definitely go check that out. I enjoyed that. It was, it was shot very well. At, near the end, there was something, and I'm not trying to, to spoil it. It is just kind of, I, I, I did want to find out if you guys 
kind of looked it up at all. It was the Morse code situation with the ghost box. Did anybody look into what that, that Morse code that was going down over the, the, the spirit box might have been? Man, that was like one of the most fascinating questions that anybody has asked us about the documentary because the answer is no. And now that I sit here thinking, I'm kind of embarrassed. How have I not? How have we not looked up what the Morse code is? Ah, oh, don't be embarrassed. Yeah, I was just wondering. Can somebody I'm, do that? Can somebody, I, can the listeners maybe help us investigate? I would imagine so. I know that, that my listeners love that kind of stuff. I know that you're going to be sending along the the Sasquatch audio. I mean, if you if you'd want to do that on on my part, yes. uh, that would be that would be fun. There might be That's, somebody can, somebody out there that w- could listen to even just once and and maybe know what it's saying. That would be pretty cool because it was at the um, was he sitting right outside of the Kecksburg right model, the, right in the parking lot, right yeah. next to the monument. Yeah, that was very strange. And you did admit in the doc that it didn't come over kind of like on the cameras, but of course you you have a maybe a better recording of it somewhere, right? Um, but that would be incredible if we had anybody out in the audience to decipher that. That would be fun. You can hear it a little bit in the actual documentary, but uh-huh. let me get a hold of my partner, Garrett. Okay. And see if he has the original recording that he took on a cell phone of where you can hear it beeping. Oh, that would be ama- That would be really, really cool. Yeah. Let's yeah, do it. That's fun. Especially since considering where where he was when that was coming through. Uh, I, I really, yeah, th- that part was really fascinating to me because you're out there kind of for, for one thing, but he's like, well, you know, may as well just try the spirit box and see what's doing. I mean, you're at a UFO monument, but let's face it, a lot of these subjects cross into each other, so why not try it? So I love that he did that. Right. Yeah. The Morse code's loose. That's what we'll call them. All right, so let's do it. Let's talk your personal Sasquatch encounters now, right? So. 2010, this is Big Flats, New York. Um, I'm not familiar with where that is, so maybe let's start there. There are rolling hills. It's a long, long mountain pass that I that I believe ca- connects, say, for example, Buffalo, Niagara Falls to, say, for example, Albany. Let's say that, Syracuse area. So western New York. Okay. And if you can imagine, it feels like maybe you're going through like a West Virginia type of area. I love telling these stories. I don't know how much time we have uh, for, for this program, so I'll, I'll try to be as concise as I can, but pretty amazing. So my ex-wife and I, were we had just moved to Niagara Falls, New York from Washington State, and we went to a concert in Big Flats, a big, big rock show that ran late, late, late into the night. Well, we lived three and a half hours away from, from, from Niagara Falls to Big Flats is how long the drive was. And the concert didn't get out till almost midnight. So I know that this is so cliche, such a cliche setup, but it honestly truly is how it happened. Her and I were driving home from the concert, and it's maybe around 1230 in the morning. And we're going through the Big Flats mountain passes, like I mentioned, rolling hills, maybe a rest stop every couple miles, but that's about it. And I'm in this old geo prism with like a gazillion miles on it that's never broken down ever since i've owned it and all of a sudden the lights go dim the power starts to die and my little geo prism actually dies it just shuts shuts down right right on the throughway and it was so funny because her and i look at each other and we're like okay this is the perfect start of a horror film how how great <laughs> how awesome is this <laughs> so we're looking around and we're trying to you know figure out what to do because this was only 25 minutes from the concert venue that's how far away we we still were from niagara falls not close enough for any of my friends and family to come help me at one in the morning so we decide that there was a rest stop within walking distance behind us and the the best bet here would be to get out and walk to the rest stop and see if we can get some help or at the very least be safer there than to sit in our car Because we are in the middle of nowhere. There's no streetlights or anything. So we get out and we hold hands because we're crossing the the throughway. We're on the right-hand side. And then there is one of those gravel uh, turnaround medians in the middle. 
And then there's the opposite direction, which we were walking to, to go backwards to the rest stop. Mind you, it's, it's pitch black. We can't see, you know, five feet in front of us. So just as we get out of the car and we walk into the gravel median with, you know, the, the loose rocks beneath us, we hear a really big scuffle in front of us and like a, um, sort of like a grunt, like a vocalization. So we stop right away because it was very loud. It's very close and we can't quite make out what it is. And I look forward and as I look up, the moon is sitting behind the direction that I'm looking and I can see the outline of like a seven foot tall, large, you know, hairy entity right in front of me. And I go into that sort of shock that some people have described it's almost like a cognitive cognitive dissonance sort of happens like mentally you don't really know how to absorb what's happening because like i can see the shape of a being that is way taller than any person he's not wearing a hat or any glasses it's just dark hair and very large and so my partner and i are just sort of staring at it and i i freeze up and i don't move and neither does she and all of a sudden, it bolts, okay? So it runs to our right-hand side, which would have been back towards right where our car is broken down on our side of the throughway. And as it's running, we can hear the weight of this thing, okay? It's, it's bipedal, okay? We're not hearing four feet. We're hearing two feet, and it's running, and you just hear this, like, the doom, 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 like heavy footsteps right past us and kicking up rocks apart. So as that happened, her and I panicked and we ran back to the car and we got in the car, closed the doors. So her and I look at each other and we're like, okay, did that happen? And she, she's like, yeah, that happened. And she's like, I, I don't know what to do. So we sit in the car for a minute and we're trying to discern what do we do? My car is dead. Like the battery is dead, dead. It won't even turn over. And I called my dad. I let them know what had happened so that my family knew that we were broken down in big flats. We're far from home and we're kind of in like this weird scenario, but we'll call them later and let them know what happens. So her and I are deciding, that, okay, we can't sit here in the car. It's cold. It's pitch black around us. We have to make a break for the rest stop. So <laughs> we reluctantly decide to get out of the car. Don't ask me why. Like we're, we're too afraid to go back to the median where in the gravel and cross the street. So, we decide to walk to the rest stop, which is an eye shot. I could see it, maybe like a quarter mile, on the side that we're broken down on now, where he, where it ran into the woods. So we're out of the car. We're holding hands. We're very scared, and we're walking along the shoulder towards the rest stop. And now we can hear it tracking with us. So I'm not the the best gauge of distance, but it had to have been about a hundred feet from the shoulder through the grass and then into the tree line right there where it was just walking along through through way with us. And we could hear each step as it's breaking the sticks. And she just goes, don't say anything. Don't talk about it. And I'm like, but come on, you, you know, you know what's happening, right? She's like, don't talk about it. She's horrified. And so we're walking and we're walking and we're walking and we're about halfway there when suddenly it makes the call. You guys have all seen the travel channel you know, the history channels, documentaries, you know, that screech, that, that definitive Sasquatch howl that it makes. We've all heard the recordings. It does that. Okay. And like I said, maybe a hundred feet from us. And it was so loud and so close. It wasn't like a disembodied screech from, you know, a mile away. We're talking like a hundred feet. And when it cut, when, when we hear it, it just it cuts like it cuts through your body. Do you know what I mean? Like it 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 gets into your bones. You just know in that moment that without a shadow of a doubt, it cannot be anything other than what you think it is. And it, it the, the sound just carries through, carries all the way through our whole bodies, and we just we just clam up, we we lock up, and we're like holding on to each other's arms and we know in that moment that it is 100 
you know, a, a Sasquatch and it is with us. And so her and I, we just, I grabbed her, I grabbed her by the hand and I just, I walked like heart, like power walked across the street through the grass, through the water and the mud, through the median and to the rest stop. And as it howled, we could hear in the distance what must have been somebody's maybe farmhouse, a house in the woods, because there wasn't any residential districts out here. Like I said, it's rolling hills. But, you know, few and far between, there are houses, I'm sure. And we could hear what sounded like three or four dogs just going off, like barking full send in like danger mode, barking in the distance because it set them off. And as her and I bolted, it didn't follow. It stopped where it was and it, it stayed. We didn't hear any more footsteps. It didn't chase after us. It was just that screech that sent us. I feel like I teleported. I, like bla I blacked out <laughs> from the point that I heard that to the point that we got to the rest stop. It was almost like uh, I lost time there because I was catatonic. And the only re reflex that I had was like sort of like, what is that term? Uh, like sort of like instinctual survival techniques kicked in and we were at the rest stop. So her and I knew without a shadow of a doubt that we had had an encounter with these beings. Now, what I find to be so funny about it is I grew up in Washington state. So if anybody's familiar with, you know, the Pacific Northwest, there's a lot of encounters there. There's a lot of personal experiences, not just with the UFO phenomenon, but uh, in extraterrestrials, but also, you know, a lot of Sasquatch encounters there, probably because that heavy densified forested area. I grew up there 17 years, never had an encounter, not once, not, not a single time that I, that I meet one of these entities, but the week I moved to big flats, New York, and my car breaks down in the middle of nowhere, I have this experience. And so, um, that was my very first sort of face to face in a sense where I just knew in my heart of hearts that that's what we experienced. There's no two ways about it. And, you know, my, my ex and I were there together to experience it, you know, in a sense to validate that for each other, that that's what happened. Well, that's a big yikes of an encounter, huh? Um, that's not a good situation to be in a broken down car and a seven foot tall being that maybe at that point you were, I don't know if you were on the fence about if they were real or not, but at that point you weren't. No, I, I just, I hadn't had any personal experiences. I believed in aliens. I believed in extraterrestrials. I'd seen, you know, ghosts and shadow people, things like, things like that in Washington state, but I'd never met a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch. And like I mentioned, I hadn't gone through any sort of spiritual awakening where I had become much more accepting of these types of beings in our reality. So to me at the time, it was, it was more scary than it was like a magical experience. I, I was pretty rocked. I Yeah, I would imagine so. Okay, and of course the elephant is, what are the chances of the timing of this very highly reliable vehicle breaking down essentially exactly in the very area where a Bigfoot happens to be? What does that mean? Thank you for asking. So this gets back into a little bit more on the metaphysical side. I, I hope I don't make anybody uncomfortable with my sort of philosophical views on it, but uh Ever since then, we have gotten into the concept of channeling and mediumship, and we've we know we have a lot of friends that are psychics and things of that nature. And we had done some sort of spirit spiritual investigations on how and why that particular contact happened, and we learned through some channeled information that it, it, it that nothing, in a sense, is an accident, but rather when we have these encounters, they're they're synchronized sort of uh, events that almost were pre-planned because look at it like this. What are the, like in a one in a horror movies chance that my car battery dies in the middle of nowhere with just my ex and I alone, you know, the circumstances are, are too specific for it to be an accident or a coincidence. So we sort of get out of the realm of coincidence and start getting into the realm of synchronicity. How are these things sort of planned and maybe orchestrated for a specific type of experience? So I think that all of the pieces are, are there for this to have been like an orchestrated encounter. And this may sound like a really strange question, but maybe nothing's too strange to ask anymore. Because uh, you're talking about, and I, I'm not disagreeing in any way, shape or form, because I do feel like in, in some instances, this has got to be true is that it was just meant to be because what are the chances of that happening at that time? But 
I get you guys a side of that and a, the synchronicities and the timing, but what does the Bigfoot get out of it? I believe that, how do I put this? So I believe that there is a sort of cosmic connection in terms of like family. So let's say, for example, the Sasquatch beings, when I mentioned before, they are sort of fourth, fifth density beings, and we are third density beings. But what if we, in a cosmic way, we're a type of family and they have maybe multidimensional perspective on reality that's more vast and expanded than humans way of perceiving? What if they have maybe psychic abilities or what if they have a, a sort of intuitive abilities that they can almost recognize the type of connection to humans, maybe almost in sort of like an incarnational sort of lineage way, like a, almost like a, a cosmic family way. Because I, I believe that the Sasquatch, they don't hate mankind. They might fear mankind for specific reasons, but they might actually have an, a kinship to us that we don't understand. And if I have a connection to the Sasquatch species, which I got to tell you, um, the the Mount Shasta story is one of the most magical experiences I will ever have in my lifetime. Uh, there has to be a deeper connection between humans and these creatures than we understand. And with that being said, maybe they were able to help influence my car breaking down. Maybe they understand the cosmic thread of synchronicity much more than we do so that they could sort of help orchestrate a face-to-face -face encounter between the two of us for some sort of metaphysical incarnational reason that I might never understand. So what do you think they are at this point? I think that they are, I think that they're a type of extraterrestrial in a sense that they're not exact. I don't believe that they're innately from the planet earth. Um, I think that they're probably creatures very similar to what we, we, we see in the spaceships and the UFOs that were maybe seeded here a long time ago from another planet. Um, I do believe that they have multidimensional capabilities, which is why we cannot capture them. We they disappear. We have so many experiences of them just sort of phasing in and out of our reality. Um, I just think that they're sort of like cosmic multidimensional beings that although they might seem more primitive than humans because they don't use technology and they live in nature, that they're deeply spiritually advanced creatures. So when you've heard, and maybe it's too early to ask this, and it, if if it is and it's coming up, just say, all right, let's wait till Mount Shasta talk because that's coming. But you've heard of people being able to essentially telepathically communicate with Bigfoot. What do you think about that aspect of it? Thank you for asking. I have been able to connect to them telepathically now. So I'm sort of telling my um, my journey and my experiences into these creatures in sort of like a very linear way. So I'm starting at the beginning and then we'll get all of the way to the point where I have a connection to them now. So I think that they're deeply psychic more so than humans. So if somebody learns how to get into a sort of telepathic meditative state or the channeling state, which is really, if you research channeling, it's not really like this sort of new agey woo woo concept. It's very scientific. It's just a matter of tuning your brainwave frequencies from your, your, your alpha, your beta, your theta, your delta, your gamma states. Um, channeling is the concept where you can just alter your brainwaves to communicate to, you know, spiritual entities on a sort of telepathic wavelength. So I've since then actually trained myself how to do it. And I think that the Sasquatch are deeply intuitive and um, psychic in that way. And that's how I've been able to learn so much about their culture and their race on more of like, say, for example, a scientific perspective since this Big Flats encounter. I'm not well read on things like astral projection, but if someone was good at something like that, and I, I, I know that it's not your physical body going to a place and if if I'm tracking what you're laying down, you're saying that the Bigfoot can 
physically and mentally go to another dimension because they're they're from that other place. Well, if someone is really good at astral projecting, do you think that they might be able to, in a way, go to that that same place that these Sasquatch are going? Absolutely. So if you take the concept of astral projection and remote viewing, I believe that they're very similar as like a sort of spirit technology. That's one thing I love to talk about spirit technology, which is what this is. Any psychic medium, any channeler, any remote viewing, any astral projection, even lucid dreaming, these are all types of what I call spirit tech. So if you can, if you learn how to do these things, then you can actually slip into what I call like the fourth and fifth density frequencies where they exist. And uh, you can actually make sort of like telepathic contact that way. Absolutely. And also when we talked about how they phase in and out of their own dimension, for the Sasquatch specifically, it's called slipwalking. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of that term, but it's called slipwalking where they can tune their physical their physical bodies, like their physical being in and out of uh, different frequency bands. Slipwalking, I don't know that I've ever heard that term before, but that is actually pretty fascinating. So, of course, the the flesh and blood folks are hollering, you know, at the top of their lungs right now. But the fact is, is we, with all this fancy schmancy technology that we have at our fingertips, we're no closer to proving this to anybody that that won't take blurry photos and what is considered, of course, one of the best pieces of, of footage, which is still up for debate, and that's not what we're here to do, but the, the Patterson-Gimlin film. If you assume that's a real Sasquatch in that film, it just doesn't get any better than that, and that's still not enough. So, I mean, to you, and, and I already know this because of how you said you approach even just going out to the woods, you don't care to prove this. To anybody, right? So when you see folks online, do you kind of just, you go, guys, you're just, you're really going down the, the wrong track. Like you're never, you're never going to prove this. It's never going to happen. It used to trigger me a lot as an experiencer and, and a believer in, in the paranormal and cryptos, cryptozoologies, extraterrestrials. Like I, I'm a big, like everybody that knows me knows that I'm like I'm big into the concept of extraterrestrials and life on another planet. And what I had to sort of achieve myself in terms of my own personal evolution was the acceptance that I may never be able to convince people of what my beliefs are. And I may never have the evidence, the tangible evidence that they need for them to assume that these things are real themselves. Because like you mentioned earlier in our conversation, which I love that you said this, is that it's almost like nobody, no matter what you show them, they're always going to be able to discredit it or debunk it in some way, shape, or form. And I think that's if they just aren't ready to accept it. So to answer your question, it's a matter of belief. And I know that that's hard for some people because, you know, culture has has taught us that seeing is believing, but I think it's the opposite. I think believing is seeing first. And it's a matter of choice. Was that iconic video of the, the Sasquatch, was it real or was it fake? We have to learn to get to the point where it's a matter of choice. Do I choose to believe that it's real or do I choose to not believe it? And every time I see a picture or a video or hear a sound bite on the internet, it's going to be fake because if it doesn't come from an official news network, if the government hasn't announced the existence of these species, then there, there's no hard evidence that people can really accept, um, which I believe, I'm sure our leadership knows about the existence of these creatures. And it at this point, not to sound conspiratorial, but it just has to be suppressed because too many millions of people have had their own personal experiences, which can never be validated through evidence that obviously they exist and our official channels will never announce it publicly. So it gets to answer your question. I know I'm kind of getting off track here, but to answer your question, it's a matter of choice. People have to just choose for themselves whether or not they, not, they believe and, and let go of needing the evidence on a video or an audio recording or a picture because it may never be enough. So I got to a point in my own spiritual evolution that I choose to believe. I, I choose to know in my heart that these creatures are out there and uh, maybe just thousands of different 
species of things that we've never heard or seen before. What if someone is, again, kind of just going back to the, you know, someone that's not sensitive, like myself. What if I went out with all the intentions in the world of having this contact, but I don't, I can't go into a meditative state. I have no idea how to do that. And if I did, even then I'm not good at it. So what if I go out there with the best of intentions and a spirit box, right? Which is traditionally used for ghost hunting. Do you think that that would be an effective way to possibly communicate uh, instead of trying to do it this telepathic way because I'm not sensitive? Yes. So we get back into the power of belief and sort of like the basic law of attraction 101 is like being the vibration that you want to experience. So what that means is there's a concept of what I call permission slips. And let's say we're talking about like um, magic or someone's into divination tools, someone's into tarot, someone goes and sees mediums or uh, somebody uses dowsing rods or pendulums. Do you know what I mean? These are what I call as permission slips that are giving you the the power you need to experience the thing that you're looking for. So for me, I use what I call spirit tech to have my encounters, but another person in their own respective journey could use a spirit box. They could use a night vision camera. They could use technology to to sort of, in a sense, manifest an experience. Because if that is a permission slip, they need to give themselves the 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 sort of momentum to to be in in the right place at the right time to have an encounter. Then I believe it will work for you. So you actually think that you could talk to a Bigfoot type entity through a spirit box? Yes. Okay, so. We've been kind of teasing this, so why don't we go ahead and dive into Mount Shasta, right? And this occurred all back in 2019? That's right. Um, I apologize in advance for how much data I'm going to hit you guys with, but I do have a linear sort of experience that really just sort of escalated into one of the greatest greatest moments of my life ever. My, my partner Lauren and I are videographers. That's what we do for a living. So um, we shoot and edit video. And we were hired to go to Mount Shasta to film a spiritual retreat. This was maybe, I don't know, maybe 17, 18 people. And the hosts of the event, they they brought us to Mount Shasta to have 10 days of uh, spiritual teachings, spiritual lectures, a lot of metaphysical exercises and then we did daily field trips where we went to the, some of the beautiful lakes and the rivers saw some of the sacred sites um, obviously mount shasta is probably one of the most beautiful places in the united states i believe so they really did a good job at taking us around and sort of giving us the tourist sort of experience so because there were so many people the host put us in two different airbnbs in the town of mount shasta itself So we had one Airbnb that was tucked away into the woods uh, down the street. And then we had another one that was a little bit closer into a residential network. The house was divided into two groups of people. So each day we would do classroom events and then we would do field trips in the afternoon. And then at night we would uh, get together at the second Airbnb for game night. So they had all of the fun, you know, pool and all kinds of like party types of games where we would get together and have dinner. And we would do that until about 11, 11 o'clock, 1130 every night at the, at the other house that was in the residential network. And then my, my air and B was two, two blocks away, tucked away sort of at the end of the street in the woods. So we had to drive back and forth between these two houses every night. And I was one of the drivers of the event. So I was always like shuttling people back and forth. Right. So a couple days I would say maybe two or three days into the event, as a driver, I was coming home by myself in the van from the second house to our house, which is tucked away down a long driveway in the woods. And it's so beautiful out here at night and still so warm in the evening that there isn't a lot of light contamination. So when I got home from the other house, I sat on the front porch by myself. 
at about 10 o'clock at night, I did some stargazing. I just looked at the sky and I was watching some shooting stars and sort of just being in sort of the energy of Mount Shasta because it's so different than living in the city. And as I'm sitting on the porch, right, this, so this is, this is point number one. I'm sitting on the porch of our Airbnb, which is right in front of a very large tree. And all of a sudden, on my left, there is a driveway of a second Airbnb that was empty. This was the only other house near us, and nobody was staying there for this week. They had a big metal fence that separated their driveway from their, from their front parking lot. I couldn't see it from where I was sitting, but I, I was very close to it. I could hear it. And I hear a loud banging noise, like a slam on this metal fence. And it sounded like if somebody was holding a big rock or a stick, and they just whacked it as hard as they could. Yeah. <laughs> look over and I'm like, that was weird. But I wasn't going to get up and go look at it because I was by myself in the dark. So I'm sitting there and I go back to stargazing, minding my own business, and it's hit again. Another big banging sound. And I said, okay, that that's weird because nobody's home over there. It's an empty parking lot. And I, I so I ignore it a third time. I get up and I'm getting ready to go into a house, to the house, and it hits a third time. And I said, okay, that's deliberate. Something, something is over there here at nine, 10 o'clock, making noise next door. Maybe it's an animal of some kind, but I'm going to ignore it. I'm going to go inside and go to sleep. The next night, the second night after our day's events, where I've got about, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, I've got about seven people in my unit. I'm totally, totally beat because we're doing 13 hour days where we're filming all day and we're traveling. And I, like when you lay down to go to bed after this, it's like, you're out. You're totally done for. So I go to sleep this night and my girlfriend, she shakes me awake. She's shaking me awake and she's sitting up in bed and she goes, Daniel, Daniel, get up. I said, what, what, what's wrong? And I, I could hear, okay, mind you, I'm in a two story house. That's huge. Okay. This Airbnb is like a, it's like a mansion. And it's segmented into two parts. There's how there's, uh, excuse me. There's bedrooms on the top floor and bottom floor of our side, and bedrooms on the top floor and bottom fly bottom of the other side on the other side of the living room, which also has the garage, the big metal sliding garage. And as I wake up, I can hear slamming noises and banging noises on the back porch, which is a big wooden back porch, and on the metal garage door, which is across the house. And it sounds like somebody, I thought maybe somebody was like up late. One of the guests in the house was a, up late like cleaning or something because I was so tired and disoriented. I, I couldn't really, like, I couldn't wake up enough to figure it out. But it sounded like somebody was hitting the house, like physically hitting the garage door and throwing stuff at the windows on the back porch and on the other side of the unit where the garage was. And Shannon, it's like, I'm frustrated because I'm so tired. I can't get up out of bed to go see what the noises are. I, I, I was so tired. I just, I almost like, I said, Lauren, I can't, like, I don't know what that is. It's got to be one of the guests. Um, I'll ask everybody in the morning if somebody was up, but I have to sleep because we had, we have to get up at seven in the morning to work again. I was like, I have to sleep. So I just went back to sleep. I wake up the next day and everybody has like a council meeting in the living room. And they're like, Daniel, did you hear what happened last night? I was like, yeah, you know, Lauren woke me up. I know that there was some noises. It sounded like somebody was outside, like hitting the house. Like what happened? And they're like, dude, there, there was what sounded like a bunch of people or creatures outside banging on the windows and the garage door. And it was so scary that they're like, we just kind of stayed in our rooms. We didn't want to go outside and investigate. But it sounded like we were surrounded, like the house was under attack. And I said, shut up. Do you think it was like Bigfoot, like the Sasquatch? So somebody tells me that there are so many Sasquatch sightings in Mount Shasta that there's a, Sas a Sasquatch day where the, the actual local residents honor the Bigfoot as like a local member of their community. Okay, that's how many sightings of the Bigfoot are in Mount Shasta. So I'm, I'm, I'm telling people like right away, I was like, okay, I've had an encounter before in New York 
if if you guys think that that's what it was, we, they might be here. Like there there could actually be a tribe of them that are out here locally, and um, I'm going to investigate this. I'm going to look into this for the rest of the week that we're here, and we're going to get to the bottom of this. Okay, so that was the the first night. I hear the banging on the metal fence. The second night, our whole house is surrounded by something banging on the doors and the windows. And now here we are now, the third night. So as we f- flash forward here to the to the third experience, I met this wonderful guy named Alexi. And he and I are both native. And we both come from sort of a native sort of heritage. And I believe uh, he's Alaskan. And he's somebody who's very in touch with nature deeply spiritual, very, very sweet man. And we became friends right away. Well, he was telling me that his tribe and his culture, they actually um, acknowledge the Sasquatch as sort of um, an honorary member of their community where they come from as well too, because they had had stories of contact throughout the history of their tribes. So I kind of link up, link up with Alexi and I say, Hey man, we're having experiences here. Would you feel comfortable coming out with me and let's go Let's let's go at night after game night. Let's walk down the driveway into the woods and maybe do some light meditation. Maybe do a little contact protocol or see if we can have an encounter of some kind. Maybe they they are here and they maybe they are open to making contact even though they seemed aggressive last night. Neither Alexi or I felt uncomfortable. We never felt like we were in danger. So we wanted to go out there and and sort of just see what happens right? We weren't scared. We only walked five minutes from the house down the driveway. So we go out and as we're walking down the trail, the the long driveway that leads from our Airbnb to the main road, you've got on our right-hand side, a thicket of woods. And on our left-hand side is the driveway of the second Airbnb, which is vacant. And then there's more woods over there. So we're surrounded on, on with woods on both sides. And we just get five minutes away from the house when we hear running in the woods right next to us, like heavy, heavy, just like I told you guys earlier, that bipedal two footsteps, very heavy weighted footsteps, like doom, 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 just scurry through the bushes right into the tree line where we're standing. And this is, this is not deep. This is not like far away. It's less than 100 feet. This is, we're talking 25, 50 feet. There's a thicket of bushes and tree here. So he and I stop right there. And he goes, did you hear that? I said, absolutely, man. Like something's going on here. Like, let's stand right here and uh, see what happens. So we're listening. Alexi tells me that in his culture of the Sasquatch, they, the, the Sasquatch that they had encountered they would make this popping sound with their hands. And I don't know, Shannon, if you've ever heard about this, but it's like a clapping sound that you can make with your hands mm-hmm. where you sort of cup your hands together. And it it sounds weird, but it makes like this, uh, it pushes air out. And you can um, pop your your hands together with your mouth. I know it sounds so weird and it makes this really loud cracking sound. So he's been telling me, but he tells me about this, that the Sasquatch make that noise. And it totally triggered me because I had been making that same strange clapping sound with my mouth since I was a little kid. And I used to do it like to annoy my teachers in class. I'd do it because it was so loud that it was like, kind of like a, I was like, you know, making fun of it and doing it in school. But I've been doing it since I was a kid. So I said, dude, I'm meant for this. Okay. I was born for this moment. If they make that sound, I make that sound. So I start to make the popping sound with, it's like a clap. And I don't know why, but I do five claps. Okay. Just five, five popping sounds. And then we wait and then we hear back three knocks. And it sounds like someone's holding a stick and they're hitting a tree trunk. And they do it three times, like three consecutive times, right in the tree line. It's got to be like 50 feet from us, like very close. They go knock, knock, knock three times. And and Alexi and I are okay. We're like, okay, that's a squatch. That is an an intelligent communication by a being in the woods 
a few feet away from us. And he and I are like having that sort of disbelief moment, that cognitive dissonance sets in, but we stay with it. We're like, okay, we're here for this. So I pop five more times again. And then they, they knock three more times back. So I'm like, okay, this is communication happening. They're here with us. These are the guys that banged on our house last night. So this is happening. So we, we keep doing it. And, and Shannon, I could do it over and over again. And they would knock back every time. So we're standing there for a good while, just going back and forth. And at one point, something was thrown from the tree line where they were at to the, the the longer tall grass that separated our little cement driveway and the tree line. There was something was thrown, like a rock maybe. And we're like, okay, that was cool. So we're having these, these knocking communication and it's amazing and it's great. It's getting really late because our, our days were running until like 11 o'clock. And so we're like, okay, let's go home. Let's just enjoy this experience that we've had this encounter tell everybody get everybody hyped up get everybody excited that like we made communication to the bigfoots out here and that they're here and like we can confirm this happening so we go home okay flash forward i tell everybody what's going on the next day well the group from the other house they always come to our house in the morning for the classrooms and two of the residents who are on the second floor of the other building they told us that there was rocks that were placed on their windowsills outside of the window, outside of the screen on the second floor of their Airbnb. And this isn't something that the guests would have ever you know, done themselves. And so I thought that was pretty amazing. So I told everybody about our, our knocking communication. And I, I hope I'm not boring people because the story is really going to escalate big time. So let's flash forward to the next night. I decided to get a little bit experimental because now we all believe, we know that there's contact being made and that these, these beings are lurking around our Airbnb because we are deep in the woods. So I decide to leave some food out. Let's experiment a little bit. Let's try to advance the communication. I mean, this is happening. Let's make the most of it. So I get um, some chips. I just I raided the kitchen, you know. I get some chips, some grapes, and there's a large tree right outside the kitchen window of the Airbnb, right by the front door. And that night, the, the the next night, I left a handful of chips on the ground at the base of this tree and the grapes. And we went to bed. The next morning, I fly outside, running out, running out there, so excited to see what happens. The chips are gone. The grapes are gone. And the um, the spine of the grapes is there. And there's uh, foot tracks, like footprints, all around the dirt outside the base of the tree. And they don't look like bear. They don't look like deer. They don't look like squirrel. There was like these drag marks, almost as if like um, somebody was walking and sort of like dragging their feet a little bit. That's what the footsteps looked like. I was like, okay, something ate my food. That's a good place to start. Okay, we do our whole day. Flash forward to that night. We do game night. Alexi and I come home and we're like, hey man, um, so so whatever these things are, they ate the food. Let's let's play again. Let's let's do something else and see what else we can make happen. So the sixth encounter is we decide to go back down the trail where we had the the knocking communication, and we get a little brave and we want to walk into the tree line this time. Don't ask me why at the time that sounds like a good idea, but we stood there for about 20 minutes and we weren't getting any knocks back. That's why we went in. I was doing the popping sound. We were doing some meditations. We were sending a lot of like peace, peaceful energy and, and loving intentions and they weren't calling back. There was nothing. There was no interaction for like 20 minutes. So we decided to walk into the tree line now where they were last night. We go in, Alexi and I sit down on the ground. It's like midnight, and we can see the beautiful moon because it's the, so clear in Mount Shasta. There's no light contamination from the cities. You can see the stars, and there's like all kinds of shooting stars. And the moon is coming through the trees where we're sitting because now we're underneath like a tree canopy. 
And he and I are just talking and getting to know each other. And we're also sitting in silence, kind of just meditating, and we're not hearing anything. Nothing's really happening. And Alexi and I decide to go home because it's close to 1230 now. And like I mentioned, these days are like 13-hour days, just nonstop. And we got to go to bed. So as we're getting ready to get up and leave, Alexi says that where he had been looking at the moon through the through the tree canopy they were under the whole time, just as he was about to get up, he noticed that one of the tree branches, very large tree branches, wasn't a tree branch at all, but there was an arm, like a huge arm. And just as he realized that, he said it jerked back into the into the tree line and disappeared. And he goes, Dan, I just saw something right in front of me. I was like, what, man? And he's like, there was an arm that was grabbing onto this tree branch this whole time we've been sitting here for like 45 minutes. And it only moved when I got up to leave and I noticed that it wasn't a branch at all. And I was like, dude, that's crazy. I hadn't seen it. I didn't see what he saw, but he he explained it to me that it was it was an arm with a hand. A huge, massive. And he saw he saw the whole arm jerk into the into the tree line, which the to be fair, the branches were very low hanging branches. They could they go all the way to the ground because there's a lot of pine trees on the west coast. So the, so the tree so the tree branches were low and he saw a whole arm disappear so that was amazing but we didn't have any of the popping and we also didn't hear anything leave nothing ran away nothing scurried off and I, this must have been like right in front of him that's how close it was for him to see the arm as large as it was so we get up cautiously walk home and i put more food out i said let's put some more food out so this time what i did with the food is I put out a slice of bread. Okay. This is what's weird. I put the chips out, a big pile of chips, and a, a slice of bread. And we go to sleep. Next morning, I run out there. I'm so excited to see what happens. And the chips are gone. Apparently, they love Tostitos chips. <laughs> and the bread, all of the crust had been carefully peeled off the bread. And the crust was gone, but the bread slice was there. Now, there was no bite marks, no nibble marks. It didn't look like an animal had been chewing on it. But no, it looked like when, you know, mom makes you a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you don't like the crust. And so she carefully cuts it off for you. It was like clean, clean sort of surgical tear. And all that was gone was the chips and the and the crust and the slice of bread was still there okay so flashing forward as we escalate uh to the next event i was really fascinated by the fact that they took that piece of bread like that i go to the store in mount shasta and i'm buying some stuff and i want to experiment with more foods that they might like to try to eat and this is where I was talking to the locals at the store of this grocery store where they were like, yeah, we have a certified Mount Shasta Day once a year to honor them as local members of our community because there are so many sightings here. And I said, well, I, I believe you because we're staying at an Airbnb about 15 minutes away and they're coming to our house every night. So I'm buying groceries for them right now to see what they like to eat. And they weren't like weirded out by that. They didn't look look at me like I was a strange, like strange. They were like, Oh, I totally get it, man. Let us know how it goes. Like they're all over the place. Have fun with it. So I bought them chocolate because I wanted to see if they might like that. I, I just assumed that they would love it because they can't access that on their own. So that, okay. So flash forward that night, I, I put out, I put out the chocolate for them. Alexi and I go out and we're trying to make contact again. We don't have anything this night. No, no clapping, no popping, nothing being thrown at us, nothing running around. It's just nothing happens. So I leave out the chips. I leave out the grapes again, and I leave out the chocolate. So 
Flash forward to the morning. I run out there very excited to see what happened. And they ate the chips. They ate the grapes. They didn't eat the chocolate. Now that confused me because I just assumed that would be something that they would really want to try, but they would really want to eat. So I'm sitting here and I'm like, why wouldn't they want that? The sugar, the sweets. And I actually, what I, what I sort of got intuitively was that they might know if there's chemicals in it. They might know if it's not natural sugar, if it's refined, if it's something that maybe they were able to identify toxins in, in the candy that I didn't know was there. That's my assumption that I got intuitively, but they did not eat the chocolate at all. So I found that to be fascinating. All right, so let's ramp this up a bit. Just got to get a little crazy now. When I went to check to see what they had eaten that morning, they left me something. Okay, this is like really strange. At the base of the tree where I had been leaving the food, there's dirt there and it's really hard soil. It's not like soft dirt or grass. It's like a hard sort of maybe like a, clay or something, but it was really thick, dense soil there. And what I found exactly where I left the food was a, like a two inch wood chip that was wedged into the dirt. Okay. And this wood chip, it was, it's like about two inches by one inch wide. And when I say the dirt is very hard, you couldn't push your finger into it like soft soil. It was hard, hard dirt. So this wood chip had to have been forcibly wedged into the earth carefully. And it was literally right where the, um, the pile of chips was. Not only was that strange, but when I took the wood chip out, which I kind of had to pull on a little bit because it was in there so good, the wood chip was burnt on one side. So one side had charcoal burn, burn marks on it and the other side didn't. And I was like, this is extremely fascinating. Now, when I was younger and I grew up in Washington State, my mom and I, we would go feed the birds and the seagulls in Olympia, Washington. And sometimes uh, if we would do it for a while, for a couple days in a row, the same seagulls would come back and they would bring us things and drop it at our feet. And it was usually, believe it or not, little clumps of grass, little clumps of, clumps of dirt and grass. They would drop it next to us. And I always used to tell myself that it was like a saying thank you, like a gift or like an offering for feeding them. So I didn't exactly know what this wood chip was, but I mean, let's talk about it for a minute. Uh, it, it's a small wood chip that looked like it had almost been carved, okay? And it was burnt on one side, and it was deliberately buried in the dirt where I had been leaving food. We have to acknowledge that that's very deliberate. Like That's a specific thing that was happening. So at first glance, I wanted to assume that it was like an offering of some, some kind, like saying thank you, like a gift. And... As I mentioned earlier, I do things like meditation and channeling, and and I connect to like a like an intuitive level. So I meditated on it, and I said, "What is this wood chip? What what is this thing that they left me? Is it a gift? Is it an offering?" And then I get like this sort of like download in a sense that it said "wood chip," and the keyword was "chip." I was like, "Okay, chip," and then it, and then I heard "microchip." like a type of technology. So I was like, okay, that's weird. And I was sort of getting like this intuition that it was some type of tool, like a technological tool that, you know, sure, maybe the Sasquatch don't have cell phones and computers, but I believe that they're spiritually advanced entities. So they have probably an understanding of nature and energy in a way that we don't. And it was almost like they made me this wood chip, which is why it was burnt on one side, some sort of alchemical exercise, maybe some sort of like, you know, divination exercise, uh, imbuing it with elements. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing here. But why? otherwise, why would it have been burnt 
And if it's a wood chip, maybe it's a microchip, just more of like a natural nature microchip. And that was like the intuition that I was getting about this offering that they left. So like, before I go forward, like, what do you think about that? So this wood chip, you you said it did seem like it had been carved in some way? Because it didn't look like it was something that just fell from a tree or it didn't look like a big piece of bark. It was um, smooth on one side. One of the edges was rounded a little bit and then the other side was burnt. So it looks like a piece of wood that they altered. Did it almost seem like a piece of like firewood that they would have pulled out of a, a fire pit or something? It could have been, but when we get off the, the program here, I'm going to send you a picture of it so you can see it. That was going to be my next is, question. Yeah. Do you still have that? I would have certainly kept that. Oh, like, absolutely. Yeah. I'm not, <laughs> I, 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 that is sitting in my office with me um, at my table where I do my podcasts. It's like a, it's like a relic. It's like a token, a memento of, you know what I mean? That's like one of my most prized possessions. So I'll send you some pictures of it when we get off here. But if if anybody's listening, I do have a vlog on my YouTube channel where I have the chip in the video as well, too. You can see it there right now. So very fascinating, the wood chip thing. But I promise you guys, the story is going to escalate. It gets even better. So, okay, flashing forward here on the next night. I mentioned, I know I made a big speech earlier in our in our conversation here that I'm, I'm not a big fan of like the recording devices because I think that you can actually, I, I believe you can amplify the probability of contact if you go out there with the sole intention of having an experience, but it being less important that you have evidence. Because if I was this, you know, mystical creature that uh, had a lot of reservations about humans, I certainly don't want them shoving a camera in my face or, or a recorder because it feels like a disconnect in terms of like the intimacy that can form between you and them if you want to have a, a organic, holistic communication. The contact should be the most important thing and whether or not you have evidence I think is less important. So that being said, I talked to Alexi because at this point, he and I are like investigative partners in this whole thing. We were going out every night to make contact and we're having these experiences. So I asked him, I said, hey, Alexi, would you feel comfortable if I place an audio recorder in the inside of the window of the kitchen that faces the tree where I'm putting all the food at night? And I don't want to be disrespectful to the entities, to the beings. I don't want to be disrespectful to you and, and your spiritual beliefs about, you know, the relationship between humans and these creatures. If you're comfortable with it, I would like to try to capture some audio tonight. He said, uh, well, thank you for asking Daniel. And I think that that would be okay. Go ahead and do it. That, let, let's see what happens. So I placed a recorder on the inside of the kitchen window with the window open. Uh, that's literally like 15 feet from the tree. And I put more food out. I put the chips and um, I put the grapes, no chocolate. Okay. I learned that. I learned that they don't want the chocolate. And I put the audio recorder out that night to see what we might be able to capture. I just let it record. So flash forward, I run downstairs. I grabbed the recorder. It ran all night. I was really excited. And I copied all the footage to my hard drives and I said okay I don't have time to listen to this but I had the plan to review all the audio when we got home from our trip from Mount Shasta when we went back to Pennsylvania so uh let me see here we had the encounter with the tree branch so flashing forward here as we're we're getting towards the end of our trip now and I put the audio recorder out Every night, like I mentioned, we would do game night at the house that was in the residential district. And because I'm the driver of this van, I have to tote people back and forth, which is about two blocks. Now, at this point in, in the event, we're telling all of our of our guests, like, okay, we're Alexi and I are like, we're having communication. We're making real contact. I'm feeding them. I'm learning what they eat, what they don't want to eat. We've seen tracks in the dirt. They've made a wood chip burrowed into the earth at the tree base. And so here we are close on like the ninth or the 10th day of the trip. And it's in the afternoon. 
and we finally have some time off. We're not doing a million things, going on field trips and doing workshops. So Alexia and I decide, because it's daylight, that we're going to actually go back to the spot in the woods where we did the meditation, and he saw the arm on the tree branch. And we're just curious to see what we might find there in, in the daylight when it's easy to see and it's safe. We're walking around, and right where we did that meditation and the tree line where they were knocking, there were uh, pine cones on the ground. Now, these like Mount Shasta pine cones are like freaks of nature. I've never seen anything like them. They've, they've got to be like a foot long and like five inches wide. And the, the spines on them, the, the petals of the pine cones, they're not soft. They're hard. They're, they're so hard that they're like they're like bone, okay? So you could pick this pine cone up and hold it, and it's heavy, and it's spiky, and you grab these little spines on it, and you can't pull them off. They're, they're, they're like solid. And there was a little mound, like a small little hill of dirt in the trees where we were walking around, and on top of the mound was a pile of these pine cone spines and they had all been carefully pulled and plucked from the pine cone itself into a pile on top of this dirt mound in the woods now that looks ritualistic to me i, I i'm i'm not I, I don't know much about their their spirit tech that they're using here with the burnt chips and what this sort of dirt mound was but i'm telling you right now if you grab this pine cone you cannot pull these spines out. You'd have to mount it into a vise and get a needle nose plier, and you might be able to get one out that way, but you can't do it with your bare hands. So they had plucked a whole pine cone of them and made a pile of these little uh, petals. And then we found we found the the rest of the pine cone, like the spine of it looked like a corn on the cob in in the bushes a few feet away. And that that's what we found where they had been standing when we did the the clapping noises and the popping noises and the meditation at night. So we found that to be very strange. I, I've never seen anything like that in the woods. I've never heard of anybody, any human doing some sort of like ritual with, with pine cones in that way. But I found it to be very strange that pile of them was orchestrated at the top of this dirt mound. And I, without a shadow of a doubt, could not pull those little spines out by myself with my bare hands. They're just in there solid. So that that was something very bizarre that happened that afternoon. Yeah, that's really unique. Do you do you guys think that's a, a symbol of approval? Like they thought maybe you would go traipsing back there and come across it and they wanted that? Or do you think that's just their version of being fidgety while all of that communication was going on and they're sitting there doing that stuff with you guys that evening? Awesome question. You know what I really feel is I think it was a fidget. It was a nervous a nervous reaction. Let's just take a minute and imagine if you're them and you've got these humans who are staying at this Airbnb on your turf in your, in your woods and they're out here, you know, clapping and yelling and waving and, you know, trying to be all try, trying to make contact and you might be a little defensive, protective. And I, I kind of felt that like that one night they threw a rock from the tree line that maybe they were sitting in there watching us while we were making the clapping sounds and just pulling it apart. Like, you know what I mean? Like you said, fidgeting. Well, also the fact that this whole little area is made up of these B and B's and then swaths of woods, I would imagine they're there a lot. However, the fact that you guys, you and Lauren were there to film for a spiritual retreat. I find that, pretty interesting and maybe not coincidental that you guys were having this communication and you happen to be there for a spiritual retreat. That's right. Yep. It's all very uh, too specific, you know. Yeah, like um, maybe if it's a quote-unquote normal people uh, that don't even think about Bigfoot and UFOs and all this stuff that we love to talk about are staying in these B&Bs, A, they probably wouldn't even think twice if they saw what you saw or experienced what you guys experienced. I mean, maybe seeing a huge arm and you thought it was a limb might be a little different. However, uh, there's the, the 
the not being aware enough to notice or be the Bigfoot know that these are not maybe the people that we want to be communicating with, right? Right. So what I want to tell you guys is, you know, that the, there, there are two more things that happened. And this is what I mentioned earlier was one of the most magical experiences of my entire life. And I'm going to lose some of you at this point. I know I have made peace with it. I accept it. But I promise you, this this is this is what happened, okay? So that same night that Alexi and I found the pine cone torn apart in the woods, we had game night one more time. And this time, because it was the last night that most of the guests were going to be there, this I think was the the tenth night of the trip, and everybody was to go home the next day. We had a big game night at the other house where people had been finding rocks on the windowsill. Okay. It's about 1130. And I'm the driver. I'm in the path in the driver's seat. My girlfriend Lauren is in the passenger seat up front with me. And in the back, I have four more people with us. Okay. So we have six people in the car. And we're driving home from the final game night because everybody's going home now. And everybody's on like the Bigfoot frenzy because me and Alexi, you know, we're talking about it every day. We can't shut up about all the contact that we're having. And nobody else had had been having their own experiences other than those rocks in the windowsill. But no one else had had anything happen except for me and Alexi. Oh, and, and the people from our Airbnb who woke up that first night when they were banging on the 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 house, right? So we we all knew that this was happening, but it was really just Alexi and I who were doing the investigations every night and trying to... Um, instigate contact. Everybody's in like the Sasquatch, like hysteria, right? So it's 1130. We're in the van and we're driving. It's just two blocks, two blocks from one house to the other. And as we're going down the road, you have to make a right-hand turn onto our driveway that goes down the long driveway to our Airbnb. And in the headlights of our van, I see right in the middle of the street and I, I swear on, I swear on, on, on everything that I have right in the middle of the road, we have a full Sasquatch live in, live in an action flat and in the flesh running down the middle of the street right in front of us on God. I promise that I, 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 it, it was the most incredible thing that I'd ever seen in my whole life. He was massive. It was, he was huge and I, he had a brown hair and he was running. And this gets back to my belief about the synchronous synchro, the synchronicity of the first encounter I had in big flats where these types of experiences, they might be orchestrated that it has to be specific because the fact that, it's right in front of my car is too perfect. Okay. So I go into shock and I don't know what to say. So I blurt out in the car. I go, <laughs> I go, everybody, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. That's all I could say because I, I wouldn't so like shock. And Lauren, I look over at Lauren and her eyes are just like, like, you know what I mean? Like wide. And we're looking forward and everybody in the van with me leans in they all lean in to look out the front window so that we can all see what's happening here so what i'm saying is i have a car of six people to to corroborate what i'm saying right now as we're as i'm watching him run down the middle of the street he gets down on all fours this is, this is gonna be, get far-fetched i know i'm gonna lose you guys here but stay with me he gets down on all fours and he's still moving away from the car, but he's right in my headlights. Okay. So it's all I can see. And now he's on all fours and in real time over the matter of about five seconds, that's how fast this happened. Almost like blinking, you'd miss it. It starts to shape shift right in front of us. Now I know that people have heard um, in certain lore in certain sort of like, in a sense, uh, stories from from tribes that talk about like shapeshifters. I don't know anything about that. But here's what we saw. 
it gets down on all fours. And we could see his very large, like Sasquatch feet. You know, everyone has seen like the, the footprints. He has like those massive feet. They almost look comical, comically large. And it's running. And it shape shifts into what looks like as a wolf with a long, bushy tail. And everybody in the car who's with me, I'm talking six people, they all agree that we saw a big, dirty brown, bushy tail hanging down. And it looked like a wolf, a large wolf. And, and just as quickly as we were like, okay, there's a big tail there now, which wasn't there before, it shapeshifts a third time into a small, very small black bear, like an, like an actual black bear. This is all happening over the matter of like five or six seconds. It's so fast. And the crazy thing is, it's right in the middle of our car. Now, mind you, I forgot to say, I had to physically stop driving. I had to stop the van because it was right in front of the van. And I'm just parked in the middle of the road, watching all of this happen in front of us. And like my whole car, everybody's leaned over, piling up on top of each other to look out this window. And me and Lauren and Alexi, uh, who he was right behind me, we had seen the whole transformation of the full-bodied Sasquatch get down on all fours, shapeshift into a wolf, and then shapeshift into a bear. Now, the two more points I want to mention about this, it's even more bizarre, is that when it reached its final form, which was a black bear, it still had the giant feet, like the, the, the Sasquatch feet that we saw on the actual Bigfoot. Like that was the one thing that never changed its form. It, it was almost, I, Shannon, it was almost laughable. Like it was almost, it looked like a cartoon character thing where it's like his feet just looked like big cartoon feet that didn't match the body. It was crazy. And the last thing I want to say about this transformation is when people say, okay, you watched it shapeshift. Here's what I want to say about that. It didn't look like a mutation, like an organic sort of like, you know, like in the werewolf movies, when the human like mutates into the the werewolf, the lycanthrope, and it looks like a very painful mm -hmm. organic process. This didn't look like that. It it looked like it looked like a hologram, like almost digital, like almost like computer digital, where it was like if you was to take um two pictures. A picture of a Bigfoot with his back to you, and then a picture of a wolf, and you kind of blend them together. Like you lower the opacity on on one, and they sort of like fuse, and they're sitting on top of each other. That's kind of what it looked like. More almost like a hologram, like digital, than it did like a, a physical mutation that would happen organically. And that was something that Lauren and I both watched happen that was one of the most strangest things. It's almost like it makes you wonder, did it really shapeshift at all? Or was it projecting like a digital image that like the brain sees, the human eyes see the wolf and the big bushy tail. We see the black bear. But maybe it was still the Sasquatch the whole time. And that's why his feet never changed. I don't know. So now we're parked and we're left with this black bear who's standing in the middle of the road blocking my, my car. Now, by the time we came to a stop, the turnoff into my driveway was just to my right, and he was in front of the driveway. So where I got my whole car is looking at the black bear now with Bigfoot feet, <laughs> some cartoon Bigfoot feet, and uh, I'm like, okay, uh, I'm in shock. I don't know what to do here, guys, but we need to go. Let's go home, and we'll talk about this. So like everyone's like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's just go pull into the driveway. So I I he's not moving, and I I just sort of like turn to the right and avoid the bear, the Bigfoot, the wolf. I, I You know what I mean? I don't know. <laughs> we pull down to the driveway and we all come to a stop and we get to the house and we're just in shock because everybody saw this. I have six people to validate and corroborate the, 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 the visual experience that we had. Now, me, Lauren, and Alexi, we saw the whole thing happen. 
And then there was three other people who were further in the back. They couldn't quite see everything play out as quickly as we did, but they all saw the the phasing of the the shape shifting, like the two pictures sort of overlaying each other, kind of looked blurry as it was sort of like mutating into these different forms that almost looked blurry. They all saw that, the whole thing like play out. And so we talk about it, we, we accept what had happened. And then the next, the next morning, everybody's going home. So Airbnb one down the street, we told them that we saw a, a Bigfoot, like a full bodied Sasquatch. And we saw it shapeshift into a, a, a wolf and a bear. And for some of them, rightfully so, to be fair, it was hard to believe. Other of them fully believe that we saw what we did because people have heard of shapeshifters like this before. And so now we're to the point where people are going home. People are going to the airport. Everyone's leaving for the event. And all that's left is me in this Airbnb. All that's left is me, my girlfriend, Lauren, and the the event host, which is our good friend now, Sue Greenwald, is a good personal friend of ours who was hosting these events back then. We were the last people because we had to close the Airbnb and then we were going home on our own plane after the guests had left. So the last little thing that I want to say to to close this story up is that Alexi and I had gone out, we'd done our meditations, we had done our contact rituals, if that's what you can call it. We'd had our experiences, and now six people had witnessed this shapeshifter Sasquatch in the middle of the street, which was one of the most beautiful and uh, magical experiences I've ever had. And we're getting ready to leave now. So our flight Mine, Lauren, and Sue's flight was meant to leave at like 10 a.m. from the Reading Airport. No, like 7, 7, 7.30 a.m. And so we had to be up really early to close the Airbnb. And then the airport was like an hour and a half drive from the Airbnb. So we were up at like 4 in the morning or like 3.30 in the morning we got up. And I said to Lauren, and I said, hey, listen, you know, you, you were too tired to come out with us with Alexi and I to do the meditations and to do the contact protocols. Um, and it's like three 30 in the morning, almost 4 AM and it's still dark out when we're getting ready to leave. Would you like to come outside with me? Just the two of us and go where Alexi and I went for the last five nights and just see if anything happens. No expectations, just send love, send peace, um, be present and, and say goodbye. Would you like to do that? And she goes, absolutely. I would love the opportunity to come out and, you know, be where you and Alexi were and just say goodbye to these beings that have been interacting with us for five, six days. So Lauren and I exit the house and we're walk, we walk right past the cars and we don't even get to halfway down the driveway to where Alexi and I had been doing all of our, our work. We're right past the cars. And to our left, on the other side of the fence where I had heard that first night, I heard that long, that slamming noise on the fence. I hear some branches breaking in the tree line over there on my left. And so Lauren and I stop. We stand there for a minute. I said, did you hear that? And she goes, yeah. And I said, they're here. They're here with us now. And I said, so I said, we're just going to say goodbye. And we're going to thank them for this amazing, beautiful experience that we've had together. I did my popping sounds. I popped five times, did the one, two, three, four, five. And sure enough, the one more time, they knocked back three times. One, two, three. And Lauren got to hear that herself. She got to experience that herself, that very conscious and deliberate communication of, you know, them basically responding and saying goodbye. So I thought that was a very uh, special and intimate experience between us and the Sasquatch, what I call a tribe. I, I believe that they were a local tribe that lives there. And I know that there were more of, there was multiple of them that we got to say goodbye. And then we went back, back in the house, got our stuff, got in the van and we left. And so I know that was a very long winded uh, explanation of, of all of these experiences, but you know, you guys have to understand that this was one of the most special things that I'd ever witnessed. So I'm very passionate to to explain these stories and share them. And Shannon, I, I want to thank you genuinely for giving me the opportunity, the platform 
uh, to talk about this because it's just so special to me. And that's that's it. That's all I had. <laughs> that's it. Well, time to uh, rent out that very same Airbnb on Mount Shasta, I have to say. <laughs> yes. That's incredible. Okay. So, plot twist. Uh, does Bigfoot and Dogman get along? Well, sure they do because they're the same entity. There you go. I mean, if he can change into a wolf and he can change into a black bear, well, most of the way, then why couldn't he be a Dogman, right? That's right. So yeah, this, it's like I... I uh... Sorry, go ahead. Never experienced anything like it. It just was life changing. This idea of uh, projection, the way you said it, it essentially had this cross fade effect, right? Like that we might put over a video uh, changing scenes is interesting to me because, and I've I've brought this up many a times, but it's one of those things that has always stuck in my mind. And that was four people in a vehicle and in the middle of the road, three people see a massive owl and the last person, the fourth person sees an alien gray, right? Um, That's always stuck out in my mind. And that's not that you guys saw something different. It's just if, if projections are a real thing and maybe how your mind processes something, or if it is the entity that can choose what you see, uh, that's an interesting concept to me. Yes. And now we have six people that can validate, corroborate the fact that something like that is out there and that it's possible. And I like your theories. I think all, uh, all are, are very probable. I, I feel like maybe if I could choose a preference, if I could have a choice, I think that they're projecting what they want us to see as like a type of cloaking mechanism. Why didn't it shift all the way into the bear? What if it couldn't? What if it tried? It, what if it has to... Like when I talk about spirit technology, you know, it's not mechanical, but there is a a language happening here between what their abilities are. And what if maybe we caught it off guard? What if maybe it didn't have time to project itself into a wolf or a bear and it panicked? And that's why it showed us all three. <laughs> what if maybe it it did it on purpose? And although it felt obligated to look like a, bl- a black bear, because we're human and that's maybe the, the the nature of things, maybe there's some sort of like cosmic law that we don't understand where they're not allowed to reveal themselves. And he wanted to give us a little hint, a little sneak peek that like, hey, I'm really here. And the the wolf aspect of this, when we're talking about size, are we talking about the well what we're assuming is still extinct dire wolf that size no no uh it it, it totally shrunk it it got down to an average one of our like almost like almost like german shepherd size oh okay which is even more bizarre because how do you go from seven feet tall to yeah just you know what i mean and and then the black bear was slightly bigger than the wolf, but it still wasn't very large for a black bear. I know that black bears aren't as big as grizzlies, but it's still a relatively small black bear. And this bear, which we know is not a bear, I guess in, in, in our terms, the, this bear was always on all fours with its yes. Sasquatch and feet. Sasquatch was on bipedal, and then he got over and was running like a gorilla, mm-hmm. and then he became a wolf. And as it as it became the wolf, its physical body like it, it looked like it was walking like a wolf would. And then the bear, the bear didn't run much at all because by the time it came to the bear form, it came to a stop. Like he physically blocked my van. That's why I want to say that like it seemed in, this whole thing seemed intentional, like deliberate that like it was meant to happen because he wanted us to see him. He didn't scurry off into the woods. He didn't try to hide behind a bush. Like he just was right there saying, here I am. Witness me. You know what I mean? And the last little thing I didn't say about the black bear is get this. It turned. When it stopped in the street, so that it was blocking the van, it was looking right at me, right at us in the car. So he turned its head so that it could look at us from like the corner of his eye. Can you imagine that? Like if like a dog were to turn and look at you kind of like halfway out of the the, the corner of his eye, it just sta- stood there and was looking at us like that sort of halfway staring at the van. And it was like a showdown. 
it was, it, I felt, I felt like it was just like, here I am. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I gotta go. I mean, yeah, it definitely seems intentional because if it can do all of those things, I'm sure it could have just phased out. It, it could have been a big foot and then just poof, gone and yeah. it wouldn't have had to show off all these different shape shifting abilities that it has. That's right. Good point. I completely agree. It all seemed very deliberate. But, I mean, you're not going to know the the answer to this, but again, maybe it does a little bit go back to the fact that your intentions were very good. You're trying to make contact with it. Everyone there is for a spiritual retreat, so maybe they're all vibrating on a different level, as we, we were talking That's about right. in the beginning. I mean, why why did you guys, why were you able to see all that? Why was that the, the coup de grace, right, the culmination of all of that? Why were you guys allowed to see that? If that's the, I don't know if that's the right word, but have you, have you thought about that? Yes, and thank you for asking. So I got to push the boundary one more time with sort of like metaphysical philosophy because when we investigate these phenomenon, if we don't have the scientific evidence where the news says this is real, then what more do we have? We have to look, we have to investigate, we have to look at this from a different way. So I feel like when I when I told you that my car breaking down in big flats and I had a face-to-face -face Sasquatch encounter was an orchestrated synchronicity. So the answer is why? When I was in a, a van, car full of people, six people, who after five days of contact, we see a full-bodied Sasquatch in the street who shapeshifts three times. Why? Why us? Why me? So my best, my best belief here, my, my assumption is that these beings, these creatures, these entities who I believe to be higher dimensional, they have a certain frequency to them, to their presence, to their energy. It's different than human. And when a human being is in the presence of one of these creatures that are, you know, borderline, for lack of a better analogy, mythological, it activates something within you, almost like a spiritual download, almost like an unlocking of uh, the DNA. Imagine if uh, you're just in the presence of something that is so cosmically out of your realm of nature and your understanding of reality that it changes you. Just witnessing it, just being in the presence can have some sort of like spiritual activation on like a, a, like a cellular level, a DNA level, a cosmic level. I feel like maybe um, just certain people who are of like vibration and have the intention to make contact and believe in their heart of hearts that these things exist it they're on a they're on a path they're on a spiritual journey of their own and when you witness something like the dog man or the moth man or a, a little you know troll type of entity you know in uh portugal or you see the terror bird, creatures that are outside of our understanding, just witnessing it and being in the presence of that creature can change you in a spiritual way. And if you as a being, as Shannon or Daniel, needs to go through some sort of spiritual enlightenment or spiritual evolution of your consciousness, then maybe just witnessing this creature and being in its presence for a moment is an activator for you and maybe because they're multi multi-dimensional beings they know this on a cosmic scale in a way that we don't understand that if they show themselves to you and make an appearance and you have an encounter with them even if it's just brief and you just see them you know in the silhouette of the moonlight the night your car broke down it might not seem like much but you could actually be unpacking spiritual implications from that experience for years. And they know that, and maybe they're helping you in some way. 
And this is actually wouldn't even count as devil's advocate because of the fact that both sides are equally just as strange and you can't explain one strange thing with another strange thing unless maybe you can and we're just way off. But to play devil's advocate, do you think it could be possible that there are flesh and blood, 100% flesh and blood Bigfoot out there and that there is something else out there mimicking what they do, the sounds that they make, and then that whole shape-shifting incident was just one of these quote unquote others utilizing these various forms. And, and I'm not saying that, you, you know, for, for the, the advocacy of this experience for Mount Shasta, so that just again, playing that other side, what if some of that really was Bigfoot activity, pulling out the petals of the pine cone? That was really cool. Uh, the arm, the, the knocks executing, a pine, um, the rocks, the rocks on the windowsill, right? I mean, a second story of my house is, don't know how far up, but it's a whole lot higher than a second story window. Some houses in Seattle. I used to live in Washington State myself. Two stories there are a lot, a lot different than, yeah, I missed that place, are a lot different than Me two too. stories here in Vegas. I mean, we're talking about if I jump out my two story window and hit badly i'm not going to make it i mean you can trip on something and, and kill yourself but i'm just saying that what if something else is mimicking the bigfoot right and because the the rock on the windowsill if there was a rock on my windowsill in my second story the last thing i would think of is bigfoot just because it is so high um but if you have a creature between seven and ten feet tall which we know they've been reported then that's possible right um i'm just wondering if if that in your mind could be a possibility, this idea of uh, entities mimicking flesh and blood Bigfoot, if you think that's uh, something that could be out there. The answer is yes. I, I absolutely am open to any of the possibilities and probabilities of what, what is out there. And I also, I'm very like, uh, how do I say this? Um, inclusive and integrative of all the polarities out there, you know, in terms of contrast, the positive, the negative. So I believe that there are sort of like mischievous, maybe, you know, dare I say malevolent entities out there that are um, both, uh, you know, playful, mischievous, or dangerous, and um, all sides of the polarity, both very loving and positive, and also open to connect. So to answer your question, I think absolutely, we could have been dealing with a variety of different things that week. <laughs> Yeah, whatever it was, you guys sure had the spotlight on you, and it's a pretty dang cool spotlight, I have to say. I I, I wasn't bored for a second. I, I think that all of the encounters that you were just describing, even just to have one thing off that list happen would be pretty damn cool. So, okay, before we, we go and you plug everything that uh, I, I definitely want you to mention, all of your podcast or both your podcasts and the doc, again, where to find it, Let's set this audio up, right? We're going to play audio not only uh, from the the doc, the Bermuda Triangle doc, the Morse code that you guys caught, and then, of course, this kitchen window audio. So I let my audio recorder from Mount Shasta run for one night, and I also let it run during the day while we were on a like a 10-hour field trip, and I made what's, what is a 20-minute compilation it's, it's it's long but it's 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 interesting to listen to a 20 minute compilation of the keynote audio bites uh, clips that i that i had captured throughout that night so i have that uh file that i'm gonna share you guys will hear a variety of things in there you will hear some knocking sounds you will hear some footsteps you can also hear in one of the clips the chips being eaten that i left out and <laughs> some really cool stuff in there there was a train close that you could hear in the distance that would that would trains would pass the airbnb at night pretty far away and as the trains would pass you could hear another sasquatch in the distance like roaring at it mm. like you could hear the separate sounds of like the the sasquatch and then you could hear the train and then you can hear uh i think there's two short little clips in the audio of some grunting some vocalizations like you'll hear some very deep uh, vocalizations that it made. And then the, my favorite part is uh, it uh, urinated, it peed like for like 15 minutes straight. And I have clear audio of it walking around 
and just peeing like a ton of times. Mm. I know that sounds kind of funny, but it was like peeing everywhere. So um, you can hear that happen in the audio. So I'll share that as well.
And then the uh, the Morse audio, I need to go through my my records and find out exactly what I have or what I can get from my partner Garrett who recorded that. But we're going to share that as well to see if anybody uh, can decipher what the Morse signal is. And was he inside of the vehicle the entire time the Morse was going off, or did it start in the car and then finish when he was standing outside of the vehicle there in Kecksburg? So that's one of those things that's like uh, really frustrating. I'll tell you guys a little behind the scenes director's moment here. When uh, me, Lauren, and Caroline were off filming something down the street, he was playing with the spirit box in that scene. He started with it in his car, and that's the audio that we have. And then when we got back from doing what we were doing down the road, I was filming Garrett, and he was so excited and he was showing us the the spirit box going like beep, 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 making the Gizmore sound. And my genius, amazing filmmaker self uh, shut the shotgun microphone off. When we left the other location, we were filming the sunset. I just shut the mic off. So when we got back, we didn't even know what would happen, but Garrett was all excited. He's running around. He's guys, guys, look, look, my spirit box is going crazy. And we could hear it audibly like with our ears what it was doing and you could guys go watch the doc you can see our faces we're all like wow that's pretty cool what the heck (laughs) but my microphone was off so i didn't have any audio of that moment of him outside the car which i'm really embarrassed about frustrated even so the only audio we do have is what he took on his cell phone when he was in the car before we got back and that's what i'm going to send you guys
All right, Daniel. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming on. Please let everybody know once again where to find the documentary, The Bermuda Triangle of Pennsylvania, any socials that you want to plug, and then, of course, both your podcasts. Absolutely. And thank you very much for this opportunity to, you know, to share myself. Um, I have my own personal YouTube channel, which is just Daniel James XIX, where I do uh, short films, web series, and then my podcast, That's So Meta, which is a metaphysical podcast that my partner Lauren and I do together. And that also has the Sasquatch vlog with the audio as well on there. And then uh, we also have uh, the Moment Imaging is my creative video service that I, I do full time where we, we shoot and edit video of all kinds of things, which I'm grateful for that job because it brought me to Mount Shasta to meet the Bigfoot. So we have the Moment Imaging on YouTube which is where you can find the documentary, The Bermuda Triangle of Pennsylvania. And then if anybody would like to connect to me, I'm always happy to communicate, meet new people and network. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And other than that, uh, that's, that's it. Fascinating conversation. Daniel James, everybody, please go check he and his work out. Daniel, thank you so much. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you for having me, Shannon.